Good morning. How are we doing today? Well, I am Rusty. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and welcome. If it is your first time with us today, welcome again. Uh, if you can, do me a favor, make note of the QR code that's going to be up on the screen. And if you can, scan that. Let us know you're here worshiping with us. And also, while you have your phone out, jump on social media and share that you are here at church or you're wa watching online. If I can talk, that would be great. So if you can, let someone know that you're worshiping Jesus and invite them in with you. But we have something very special for you today. Are you all ready for it? So I need you to make, or raise your eyes above me. I don't know what I'm going to talk about today. And we have a wonderful baptism that you'll see PC coming down for. Hey, thank you, Rusty. Good morning, church family, church friends. I'm Pastor Cameron, lead pastor here. They call me PC. Uh, kind of a nickname. Glad to be able to be in front of you today, standing here in the baptistry. Listen, I have the honor of introducing two young men, one of whom is going to be baptized, the other of whom God used to bring the young men to be baptized. Matt Ireton, our student ministries pastor, is going to bring down Jaden Eubanks. You guys come on down here. Stand right here for us, Jaden, man. Hey, I had an opportunity to sit down with Matt and Jaden, and Jaden shared his testimony, shared with me a little bit about what God did in his life at camp, how God has been working in his life up to that moment. And I got to tell you, uh, it, it's, it, it's not often that I meet someone like Jaden who has the sweet spirit of Jesus about him. And it is just so apparent to me that God is working in his life. He's, he's worked through his baptism materials. Uh, he understands what it means that Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior. But I want you to hear it from his lips uh, very quickly. Hey, Jaden, to you, who is Jesus? My Lord and Savior. Awesome. That is awesome, man. Yeah, we love that. Matt, you've been so key, so instrumental in bringing him to the Lord. Uh, why don't you baptize him? Man? Awesome. Have you turned, buddy? Man, it's been cool. Jaden um, has been part of our youth group for a while, a little while, and just seeing him grow has been so cool. He's also been a part of uh, FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and we're just sitting in here like five minutes ago, and I'm like, hey, we need some leaders at our campus like to help lead our football team. Is that something you'd be interested in? He's like, yeah, sure. Like, <laughs> it's like so easy, like, yes, I'll, I'll do that, so... I'm just proud of this guy. I love him. Love seeing just, like, the countenance on his face since, like, camp and the salvation experience. And it's just been a blessing to me. So, brother, let me, let me get you wet. Let me scoot you over because you might hit the end there. Okay. Uh, hey, based on your profession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ. Raised to walk in a new life, brother. Take a look at these people. <laughs> All right. Good work, I love it. I nice love job. it, guys. Aren't you excited at what God's doing? God is at work at FBC Longview in the lives of young people, young families, and old families and old people in Longview, Kelso, and all over this area. And let's celebrate what God is doing. Let's stand up together. Let me pray, and we're going to worship. Father, I thank you so much for the testimony of Jaden. I thank you so much for death, burial, and resurrection. The death of Jesus Christ that sacrificed for us the Lamb of God to take away our sins. If only we will, like Jaden, submit to his Lordship. And Father, thank you for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead that we too are symbolically here in this time and ultimately raised along with him in the end to eternal life. What a wonderful thing that is to celebrate. We do so now coming to you this Sunday in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing it out.
sing this reminder with me this morning, would you? Who am I the God?
in this moment, God, to really realize that you are a living hope, that you're not a dead God that we just read about, and we're so thankful that you did miracles for people that we read about, but you are still living and breathing in the form of the Holy Spirit in each of us. God, right here, even in the midst of this place, I can only imagine how your angels celebrated this morning when a young man stood in front of all of us and said, I choose you. God, I pray a hedge of protection around him and his family this week because we know Satan hates this. But you, once again, have won the victory. And we are so thankful to be part of that this morning. God, thank you for being a living, our breathing hope. May we cling to that in these days to come. Help us to get our eyes up and our focus on you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hey again, everybody. I'm Pastor Cameron, PC coming at you as the lead pastor of FBC Longview. Good morning to those of you who are with us at our online campus and also those of you who are going to be watching this week at KLTV and all of us here at the 747 campus, the flagship campus, want to wish you a good morning. Good morning, 747 campus. Oh, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, let me ask you something. How are you doing with discouragement? How are you doing with it? We've been talking about it for the last two weeks. We're going to talk about it again this week. How to deal with discouragement. Now, we deal with discouragement, right? We wrestle with discouragement. Sometimes it's the case that we don't necessarily always overcome discouragement, but we are always overcoming discouragement if we're dealing with with discouragement. We want to wrap up our series on dealing with discouragement in God's Word today. So I want to ask you to turn with me in your copy of God's inerrant inspired Word to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is where we will be today. 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. 2 Corinthians is in the New Testament. I always like to remind our guests of that because if you're over there in the book of uh, hesitations, uh, you've got problems, okay? So just keep, keep moving, keep getting there, you'll get there. Second Corinthians, we're going to be in chapter 4. We'll start together today in verse 13, so once you get there, take your index finger, put it right on the verse, and look back up here at me. Have you ever, have you ever put the wrong fuel in your car? It, you know, if you have a gasoline engine, you can do thousands of dollars worth of damage to your vehicle if you put diesel in that bad boy. I don't know if you know that or not. I, I, I kind of knew that, uh, but there was a moment in our marriage where I, I nearly uh, ruined the only brand new car we have ever bought together in our 27 years of marriage. Uh, and and I, I may have ruined our, our marriage. I, 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 I've had good intentions, I got to tell you, okay? I, I wanted to to take my wife's car and gas it up for her. I pulled in. And I wasn't just going to get her gas. I was going to get her premium. And, and, and so I, I reached all the way over. And I saw the premium. And I thought, no, I need to get her better than that. I'm going to get her super premium, right? So I reach as far as I can. What I didn't realize is the labeling on that particular hand pump was what? Diesel. Today, we're going to look at this passage, uh, under the uh, understanding, with the understanding that the church at Corinth is trying to fuel their fire with the wrong stuff. They're trying to, to engage their passions, but they're, they're, they're doing it with the wrong fuel. Maybe the wrong spirit, we could say. As we look into our text today, uh, we're going to discover that Paul is trying to get them to see the light before it's too late. If you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, shout, got it. Let's read together today. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, quote, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Knowing that he, that's Jesus, who raised, or God, who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sakes. So that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For a momentary light affliction is producing for us eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see all those verbs of seeing right there? See how many times he uses that, that kind of terminology? You see that? If you see that, say see. See, see, I look at your neighbor and tell him, see, see, yeah. Uh, notice that he uses that kind of verbiage to begin, uh, or, you know, well, to sort of wrap up all of this. Notice, too, uh, that he opens this up with some particular kind of language. It's, it's language that makes an emphasis on the right spirit. He talks about this 
particular spirit, this same spirit, the spirit that is defined by grace as he takes it further in. Why? Why is that his emphasis? Well, because taking heart requires the right spirit. Taking heart requires the right spirit. Gassing up your car requires the right fuel. Taking heart, overcoming discouragement requires the right spirit. Okay, so what? That's a good question. Because taking heart requires the right spirit, we've got to see the light that reverses our plight. See the light that reverses your plight. Right now, I'm not in light very well, so I'm going to ask my light guys uh, to cause us to see the light and turn up uh, much of the stage lights right now so that I'm not in a black hole. You ready for that? Ten, nine, eight, seven. He's working on it. I know he is. Six, five, four. He's going to be praying about it. We'll just leave that with him. That's not even, I'm not even going to charge you for that. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, that's extra. All right. So, anyway, uh, listen, I, I want you to understand today, as we discuss the concept of overcoming discouragement, uh, of finding the encouragement that we need, there is a way to do that that God ordains, and He speaks that through Paul to the church at Corinth. As we've discussed over the last couple of weeks, as they are facing some of the greatest discouraging days of their time in their church, in their community, in their lives. The important thing is to see the light that reverses your plight. So what we want to do is we want to commit to unity with our church. I want to give you four C's today that are going to help you overcome discouragement. C number one, CC, commit to unity with your church. Now, uh, let, me, let me point this out to you. You have to claim a church in order to be with a church, to unify a church. That's important here. So, so that's a part of the premise of what we're understanding, okay? And, and I'm telling you that as Paul talks to the church at Corinth, he says it's important to commit to unity, church at Corinth. And that's the message for us here. In verses 13 through 15, the primary theme is unity. Unity is an attitude issue for the church at Corinth. And that translates and applies for us as well. It's an attitude issue. It's not necessarily about the gathering per se. It's not necessarily about checking off a box that says you went to Sunday school. That's not unity. Unity is an attitude. In this particular context, they had attitude problems, and so he's addressing that. There needs to be a unity, uh, or rather an attitude of unity. He begins there in verse 13 talking about this concept of the same Spirit. You see it there? The same Spirit, and, and because of that same Spirit, we believe and we speak. Now, it's important to understand that this is a quote from Psalm 115. He's quoting the psalmist here, and he says, because I have the same spirit as the psalmist, you and I have the same spirit together with the psalmist, so too do we have the same mission of the psalmist. In other words, he's, he's pointing backwards, and he's saying, we have sort of this historical precedent that indicates to us that we have a mission ahead of us. And isn't it great to think, church, Paul says to the church at Corinth. Isn't it great to think that the psalmist, the, these people that we so revere from so many years back, uh, the psalmist has this spirit that we share along with him. This same spirit, this same cause is the same cause and spirit that you and I share together. Along with the church at Corinth, along with Paul, along with the psalmist, along with the prophets, along with the patriarchs. My friends, we are a part of God's bigger picture and longer range plan. That's the kind of spirit that Paul indicates is the right spirit. He says a little bit further in, in verse 14, he says, at some point, at some point, Jesus is going to come back, right? And there's going to be this resurrection from the dead. 
And we're all going to stand before the judgment seat. And we're going to stand before the judgment seat together. He uses the phrase, He's going to raise us with you. There's a concept there of togetherness. In the end, other, uh, in other words, in the end, what's going to happen is I, Paul, the apostle, will be standing right there with you in front of Christ. And in the judgment seat of Christ, all things are made equal. He says, so let's be a team. Let, let's understand what our end game is. If our end game is together, then let's play the game together. He goes on to say in verse 15, he says, listen, for all things are for your sake. Because of these things that I just pointed out, so everything I do is for your sake. See, Paul had it right. He understood what joy was all about. Remember that old adage from the 80s and 90s? Joy. It, it starts with Jesus, then it's, it's others, and then what's the why? Yourself. Very good. That's all the Xers that knew that one. Uh, listen, uh, yeah, yourself has to be last in the order there. And so that's what Paul is indicating here. He says, listen, guys, it, it's not about me. It, it's for me. I'm living for you. I'm serving you. But... That is not meant to indicate to the church at Corinth that they're supposed to live for themselves. No, as a matter of fact, it's supposed to exemplify for them. This is how you're to live your life. And when you're living your life for someone other than yourself, then you're able to access that right spirit because that's a part of that commitment to a unity with your church. So that, he says... There in verse 15, the grace can be spreading. Unity coming together in our attitude towards one another, in our love for one another, connects us. And that connection is a conduit for the grace of God and the great commission of Jesus Christ to be spreading not just to one another, but to everyone with whom we come into contact in the week. We've got a bad plug in our house. Husbands are funny creatures. B because they understand some things, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do anything about it. Uh, I, I am a husband, so I'm a funny creature. I'm speaking from experience. We've had this bad plug in our house since we moved in. Now, what's wrong with this plug? It's probably very simple. It's probably just very simply the fact that, that, that somewhere along the line, uh, there has been a, a disconnection. A, a wire, a simple wire, has pulled loose from the outlet. Really, all it would take is, is for me to go in and take maybe, you know, maybe, what, 15 minutes at the most and reconnect that wire. Now, in part, it's because I'm a husband that I haven't done that yet. And in part, it's because I'm a cynic. Because I know that that, that stupid thing is going to take me 12 hours once I open it up. There's going to be something bizarre. But in all honesty, uh, the truth of the matter is, it is probably just a simple connection problem. Have you ever thought about that? H have you ever thought about that uh, we have electricity flowing all over this grid in this country? And electricity travels for miles on these giant wires uh, from one port to the next port, from one port pole to the next pole, uh, from a generating station all the way to your home. Really, if you begin to think about that, it is baffling. But think about this. All it takes is one small, minute, microscopic, millimeter disconnection. And it's all shut down. My friends, we can't be empowered to overcome discouragement if the primary means of overcoming discouragement is the right spirit and our attainment of that right spirit is spiritual connection with one another. If we don't have an attitude of unity, we are disconnected from the power that is available to us. 
And so that's why Paul tells the church at Corinth, listen, commit to unity with your church. This is the closest I come, closest I come to name it and claim it theology. Are you ready? Name your church, claim your church. And then acclaim your church. Did you catch that? Name your church. In other words, decide this is my church. Wherever you attend, Wherever it is that God has called you, you make that local body your church. Claim that church then. Be involved with that church. Invest your life in a church. Unify yourself with a local body of believers. And then speak well of that local body of believers. Acclaim your church. My wife and I went to lunch yesterday and and she has these questions. I love it. I recommend this to you, by the way, if you're married uh, or thinking about getting married. She has these questions. You'll have to ask her where she gets them. She's right over at Tiffany. She, she gets these questions that you can ask that are conversation questions. They're beautiful. She'll ask one question. We'll talk for 30 minutes about it. I love it. And they're questions we would never, because I'm just a dull-witted guy, we would never think of. Uh, she might think of them. I wouldn't. She asked me yesterday, what's one thing that you're most proud of about your parents? I like that. I thought about that for a while, and I thought about the legacy of my parents, that wonderful believers. All my life, it was just church day in, day out. And they were not perfect parents. They would be the first to tell you that. They were not perfect Christians. But here's something that I really admire about my parents. They have been in the same church since before I was born. And guys, that church has gone through hard times. There was a moment in my life when I actually said something to, to my parents, I went, maybe you should find another church. And say, we'll pray about that. You know what God told them? Exactly what God is telling us here. Name your church, claim your church, acclaim your church. Unify with your church. They have seen that church through hard times, prayed that church through hard times, have seen pastors come and go and supported each of the pastors and, and loved their way through the people who caused struggles for the church, and loved their way into integrity. And they have shown me what it means to commit to unity with your church. One of the things that I've watched them do, though, it, it, and I think it's, applicable for us. They, they drop their own agenda, right? In essence, that's something that I think Paul would have the church at Corinth understand and, and for us to understand. We've got to drop our own agenda. When he says, we do all these things for you and exemplifies that for us, it means that it's no longer about me, right? I have to drop my own agenda if I want to commit to unity with my church. In fact, as a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians, which is the first letter, right, that he sent to this church, he addresses that very same thing in the very first chapter. He says, listen, you guys are playing favorites. You've got a staff over there, a large staff at your church, and each of you are thinking, well, I like this guy better, I like that guy better, I like this guy better. He says, that's not how this works. He says, we're a team. And not just the staff, but the entire church. It's not about who is better fitting in with your agenda. In fact, drop your agenda entirely if you want to commit to unity with your church. The other thing that we can do to commit to unity is to advocate for our church. Advocate for our church family. Advocate for our brothers, for our sisters. You know, there are a lot of opinions out there, aren't there? <laughs> oh, the pandemic. You're killing me, Smalls. I'm telling you guys, there are all kinds of opinions out there. 
Uh, can I tell you that, that, that it, it may be the case that we're going to have to set aside opinions if we're going to love one another like church family, if we're going to commit to unity in the church family. It may be that if I'm going to advocate for my church, advocate for my brother or sister in Christ, advocate for my church family, that my opinion is something best kept to myself and lived in my own conscience. My job as a Christian, not as a pastor, as a Christian, is to advocate for you. Your job, wait, let's, let's divide the room, okay, right in half. Your job over here is to advocate for these people over here. Your job over here, gang, is to advocate for these people over here. And now let's mix it up. Peace in the church has to do with that particular attitude of advocating for one another and setting aside our own agendas, our own favorite opinions. Why? So that we can commit to unity with our church. That's how we charge ourselves up. And I think that's going to be important for understanding how to overcome, deal with discouragement. Charge up your enthusiasm. Charge up your enthusiasm. Now, I don't mean work up your enthusiasm. I mean charge it up. Uh, sometimes we get those mixed up, don't we? We sort of just kind of mustered up within ourselves. I'm going to be excited about Jesus. And deep down inside, maybe you're dying. Listen, what I'm talking about is a spiritual charge. Paul talks about this common spirit that we have. We have with one another and we share with the prophets and the psalmists and the patriarchs. He uses the terminology of we. What he's doing in verse 16, interestingly enough, the very first part, he's shifting. He's shifting the focus. He's shifting the focus from the, the past as a cause for our present purpose to the future eternity as our present motivation. The future eternity as our present motivation. This is where the shift comes, and when he uses this phrase, he's repeating it. He's repeating it from verse 1. He says, we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart. Now we've heard that phrase Already, the first week that we opened up this series, this little three-part series, uh, we heard him use that phrase. It's important to note that he uses it twice because he's trying to kind of create an, an envelope, right? He's trying to envelop, if you will, the entire passage in that singular important idea. We will not lose heart. We do not lose heart. It's not even in future tense, and that's kind of important to keep in mind. We don't do it currently, and we are not doing it ongoingly. We don't lose heart. What does it mean to lose heart? We haven't really explored that much. Let's talk a little bit about that. One interpretation says to lose one's enthusiasm. To, to become discouraged is, is a very simple definition of that. A, another use of this term in Scripture is to default to bad behavior because you've become weary of doing good. Or to become dispassionate. Dispassionate in particular about Jesus. One of the reasons that our mission statement includes, first and foremost, we are passionate about Jesus. We're growing our passion for Jesus is because without that passion, we lose all hope of ever having the right spirit. One German theologian says of the definition of this concept, he, he, he says, it's like a bull pulling in his horns. H have you ever been to a rodeo where a bull just won't kick those legs? Uh, 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 you ever been to a rodeo where that, that bull, is, he doesn't want to kick his legs, and he doesn't want to swing his, his head around anymore, doesn't, doesn't want to try to gore anybody, he's just, kind of, he's just kind of chill. I mean, that poor cowboy has to have a re-ride because that bull won't do what he's supposed to do. You know what's happened? He's lost his heart. 
And that's where Elmer's glue comes from. That's just for you, baby. Say, Pastor, that's a lot of bull. That's what I'm saying. All right. Listen, though, if you, if you get into the arena and you lose heart, you're of no good to the kingdom. But we don't lose heart if we understand where the charge of enthusiasm comes from. And Paul says... Not just we don't lose heart, he says, therefore we don't lose heart. Now you have heard preachers say this before, so I'll say it again and just give you a nod and a wink. When we see therefore, we ask, what's the question? What's it there for? Yes, and so as we look at that big word therefore, we want to ask ourselves, what's Paul after? He's, he's pointing to the previous principle to talk about where our charge of enthusiasm uh, comes from. He says, uh, when essentially what he says in verses 13 through 15 as he works us into 16 is this, in principle form, when we share together in a unified spirit focused on the mission, we can. We can together. Why? Because we access the encouragement of Christ to take heart when we're together. That's why in 1 John 1.7, the apostle there says, listen, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And not only that, because we're walking in the light, as he is in the light, because we're fellowshipping with one another as a result of that walking in the light, we are cleansed of our sins and empowered by the blood of Jesus. There's where our enthusiasm comes. There's where our passion lies. There's where we overcome discouragement. It's when we can have that spirit of unity together, that commonality, an understanding that we are in this together despite how trite that might sound to you. It is the sight of Christ in one another that inspires us and enthuses us. Charges up our enthusiasm. There's a paradox here, though. We've seen this in the pandemic. When we most need to have commonality and spiritual community, that's often the time when most human beings begin to back away from it. When we most need it, we don't want it. We reject it. No, notice again, in both uses of this idea of losing heart, in verse 1 and in verse 16, first part, he says, listen, we don't lose heart. Losing heart is not something that you do as an, or rather, gaining heart, rather, taking heart is not something you do as an individual. Taking heart is something that you do uh, with weeness. I just made that up. Uh, it's, it's something that we do together. The way we charge up one another is by sharing in the priority of the mission together as church family. That's how you charge up your enthusiasm. You want to see the light that reverses your plight? Commit to unity with your church and charge up your enthusiasm by that unity. But here's the thing. The, the obstacles that we face in sharing in, in this way are prevalent. Interestingly enough, they are more about perception than they are about reality. And so Paul makes a shift here. And he says, challenge one another's reality. Challenge one another's reality. Reality for us is oftentimes a matter of perception and perspective. There in verse 16, the second part, and verse, through verse 18, Paul contrasts two realities, doesn't he? You see what he says there? 
There is the reality of the outer man and then the reality of the inner man. There is the reality of the eternal and then there is the reality of the temporal. He says one is rotting away. One will last forever. One is about material things. That toy that you got for Christmas that you forgot about two weeks later. Uh, The other is about stuff that's going to matter a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a million years from now. Well, a million, that's a lot. That's reality. The real reality. When in verse 18 there he shifts to this concept of temporal versus eternal, he's talking about life beyond temporary things into glorious forever. And when we get this reality, he goes on to say, then the affliction that we have. He admits that there is affliction in our lives. He admits that there is difficulty in our lives. We talked about that last week. There is pressure in our lives. There is pain in our lives. He says this is affliction. This is tribulation. But when we get the fact that it's about the eternal, not just the here and now, then the affliction is momentary. Now, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Because it's a perspective change that we have to gear ourselves up towards. That's why we need one another to challenge each other's reality. The reality you and I live oftentimes is not the reality of actuality. Certainly, we are not by default objective beings. We need one another to help us get to objectivity of reality, to challenge one another's reality. That's a lot of itty words. I heard about a businessman, Christian businessman, who was reading Peter. He read that line where Peter says, to God, a thousand years is as one day, and one day is as a thousand years. That just stopped him in his tracks for a little bit. He, he, he wasn't stumped, but it just made him think. He, he decided he was going to pray about this. So he, he got into his little prayer closet that he made for himself. You know, he heard Jesus talking about a prayer closet, so he got into a prayer closet, and, and he started talking to God. He said, hey, God, so let me get this straight. A, a thousand years is like just one minute to you. God said, yeah, yeah, you could, you could say that. One minute, that's right. The businessman said, wow. So, so to you, a million dollars is like just one penny, huh? God kind of chuckled a little bit. He said, sure. The businessman smiled, a big businessman smiled, and he said, hey, God, could I have one of those pennies? God said, sure, wait here one minute. Some of you will get that after lunch. Adrian Rogers, great preacher from, from Tennessee, he said, God is never late. He's always on time. He is never in a hurry. You and I have a limited perspective. So we look around and we see a world in chaos, a life in pain, our families in trauma, uh, our church in difficulty, uh, our politics are broken, uh, our material goods are waning, our cars are malfunctioning. Our bodies are not doing well. Our doctors are concerned. And and yet, my friends, that has nothing to do with eternal matters. It does not mean that God is not at work. God is at work in every day and every second of our lives, even in the midst of what looks like absolute chaos. God is still in charge. And God has something for us so that we can overcome come discouragement it's called eternity and it's a matter of perspective but we need one another to challenge each other's perspective 
My friends, when we gather, whether it is here or out and about, when we gather two or more together in the name of Jesus Christ as members of a local body of believers, it is our responsibility, therefore, to challenge one another's reality. We have to be very careful not to enable someone who is negative. Because we want to be a loving ear to listen. It's good to listen, but always challenge. I say that as a person who needs that oftentimes. Empathize, sympathize, but don't enable. One of the best ways to do that is just simply this. Yes, but. Yes, but, and you fill in. To challenge one another's reality. Here's where the conversation should always be ready to go. It should always be ready to go to Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith. The one raised by God the one for whom we live our lives. And so we can convert our outlook with converting conversation. Converting conversation is conversation that shares your faith, that expresses what Jaden has expressed to us this morning in the baptistry, that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He can be your Lord and Savior too. I've been resurrected to new life, cleansed of all of my sins. You you can have that too. And, And you know what? If you already have that, isn't it great that you do? And isn't it great that we do together? We convert our outlook through converting conversations. It changes how we think and how we live. I'm going to take you back up there to verse 13 where Paul says, But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Believing equates to speaking. Faith lived out is faith spoken aloud. One of my staff members reminded me this week, PC, one of the best ways to learn something is to teach something. One of the best ways to remind your faith and to bring your outlook to a faith outlook is to share your faith and to talk about Jesus with one another. Talk about Jesus with those that you're around at work, at the supermarket, at Freddy's, at, at, at any place you go. You can change, you can convert your outlook with converting conversations. I stood there at the gas pump, that nozzle in my hand, and for some reason it would not fit well into my wife's car's gas tank. I mean, I I moved it around at all kinds of cattywampus angles and finally I got it to just kind of barely go in after I I tipped it up right and and, and I realized I'm going to have to hold it right here. And and my hand was arthritic looking by the time I was done finagling that thing into the tank. And I could not understand what was going on. I began to murmur and mumble and grumble about the gas station. I'm never coming here again. They're not updating their pumps, apparently. And what's going on? Uh, I'm such a smart guy sometimes, you know what? Uh, I reached over and I flipped the switch to the pump. And it was about at that time that I heard a voice from the other side of the pump. Mister? That Japanese car of yours been converted to diesel? I looked over, there was a farmer leaning up against his truck. Piece of straw in his mouth. Cowboy hat on. He just kind of looked at me like the idiot that I was. And suddenly I saw the light. 
because of a word from a farmer. That kept me from a plight of ruin. Today I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you to be encouraged by the right spirit. Because taking heart requires the right spirit. See the light that reverses your plight. Let me pray for you. Father, as we come together today, there is discouragement all around us. There are a lot of reasons to focus in on our affliction. We find ourselves in difficulty with people in our lives, relationships that we have that make us angry. But Father, we understand that if we will access the right spirit, we will be able to overcome discouragement, not just deal with it. Help us, Lord, to see the light in the ways that Paul has given us here today. Lord, I pray for those who are among us, whether they're here at the 747 campus, at the online campus, watching on KLTV. There is someone who is listening right now, watching right now, that does not have a relationship with you. Has never come to a place where he or she is born again. Has never been converted to Christ. Lord, we pray for them right now. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, God, Father, draw them to yourself to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Church friend, if that's you here today, I want you to listen to me. You must be born again for any of this to work. For you to be able to access the Spirit of God, the right Spirit. There is no Spirit righter than the Spirit of God. You must be born again. You must be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. The Apostle Paul tells the Romans that all you have to do is confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord, believing with everything you've got that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you will be saved. What does that look like? Well, it looks like praying a prayer, something like this. Why don't you pray this? I'll say a phrase. You say it in your heart to the Lord. Be born again today. Say, Lord Jesus, I call upon you. Father, I want to be saved. Holy Spirit, come and fill my life. Jesus, from this moment on, I will live for you. I ask that you be my Savior. And I hereby make you my Lord, my Master. I pray these things in your name. Father, we pray for those who just prayed that prayer. We ask that you would, in filling them with your Holy Spirit now, that you would give them a sense of courage and clarity to understand what it means to answer an invitation to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ right now. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Church family, church friends, I want to draw your attention to something that uh, Pastor Rusty mentioned a little bit earlier, and that is our online connect card. If you happen to be watching online, you can see the links on our social media site and or sites for other platforms and then on our website right above my head is a link to that online connect card or you can use the qr code that's down at the bottom part of your screen for us who are here at the 747 campus i want to encourage you go ahead and open up your phone right now and then if you open up your camera app if you've got a smartphone uh, you can scan that qr code it's going to bring up a link that you can click you click on that link and what that's going to do is open up our online connect card if you're here today and you just prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, if you just prayed along with me to be saved, we want to know about that. We want to ask you to let us know about that through this online connect card. 
uh, simply fill out your name and your information. Scroll down to the section that says next steps and you'll see various boxes that you can click to indicate what God is doing in your life today. Click on whatever box applies to you. Maybe you prayed to trust Christ as your personal Savior and Lord today. Click on that box. And then when you're finished, be sure you hit the submit button right there at the very bottom. What will happen is I'll receive word of that in the office, and I want to be in touch with you this week. Emailing back and forth, or maybe a phone call, or, uh, or just in the mail. Get some information in your hands, help you understand what it looks like to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. So do that for us if you will today. Uh, Guests, by the way, I hope that you'll share your presence with us through that online Connect card as well. Whether you're here at the 747 campus or at the online campus, uh, even if you're watching for the first time on KLTV, we want to know that you're with us today. You let us know. I'm going to send you a special gift in the mail as my way of saying thanks for being here. All right, so guests, be sure you let us know about your presence here today. Good? Thank you guys so much for the opportunity to share with you in God's Word. Uh, I hope you have been challenged today, Uh, but I also hope that you have had a little bit of fun today with all my bad jokes and silly stories, great music, awesome baptism with Jaden. This has been a good day. We got a lot of good days, a lot of fun days coming in the days and weeks to come as well. Let's check that out on our first word. Hey, good morning. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Aaron Nelson, and I'm the Connections Pastor here at FBC Longview. We've got some great things planned that will help you grow in your passion for Jesus and your compassion for others that will bring transformation to all. We have nine more days of our school supply drive left, so you can drop off any of those school supplies you have purchased here at our 747 campus. Next Sunday, we're having our good old-fashioned summer cookout. This will be a sweet time of fellowship where you can just hang out with some of your brothers and sisters in Christ while eating some great food and playing some yard games. All you need to do is show up with your appetite for some hot dogs, hamburgers, and fellowshipping. See you there next Sunday, right after second service or at 1230, whichever comes first. September 5th, if you are not part of a small group here at FBC Longview, we would like to invite you to try one out on September 5th. Starting that first Sunday in September, all of our small group ministries from our youngest kiddos to our most senior adults will be called disciple groups. In these disciple groups, we will begin a three-year journey together, starting in Genesis and ending in Revelation. On this journey, each week we will learn how all of Scripture is telling one unifying story about Jesus. In addition, each sermon will have an intentional piece of discipleship group in it, which we will be able to dive deeper and actively apply Scripture to our own lives in these disciple groups. In these disciple groups, we will be figuring out discipleship and begin to allow Jesus to transform us to be more like Him all the time. Hey, would you let us know that you're worshiping with us today? The best way to do that is to complete our online connect card at fbclongview.com. Guess we for sure want to hear from you right now through our online connect card so we can send you that special gift in the mail. And thank you, FBC Longview family and friends, for your giving of your tithes, offerings, donations, and your prayers. And remember, every Sunday is a fun day with FBC Longview. All right, thank you. What's up, at PC Longview Online Church Community? This is PC coming at you. Thanks so much for worshiping with us at our online campus. Hey, be sure to like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can catch all of the great stuff happening at FBC Longview, both at our online campus and at the 747 campus. Also, if you've been impacted by what you've experienced here today, if you've enjoyed your time with us and you'd like to be a part of the amazing life transformation Jesus is accomplishing, through FBC Longview, we want to invite you to donate to Christ's cause. Help us bring you more great video experiences like this one. It's really simple. You can donate on your phone by texting the word GIVE to 360-295-9272 or you can head over to fbclongview.com and click on the Donate tab. Thanks so much.